Hello, I'm Nicholas Kitchen. I'm Artistic Director of the Heifetz International Music Institute. And uh, this video is in order to guide you through the process of what I uh, like to call checkerboard chamber music. And this is a, a way that we can play um, chamber music and interact with actually very fine details, even in the restrictions of being in different places. Um, it involves sending back and forth files, and it involves using headphones uh, and a program that can allow layering of different parts. And I'm going to just guide you through all of that. So let's start with our setup. Um, we may show different ways to do this. It can be done with a, an iPad, even an iPhone. But today we're going to use a computer. So I'm going to use my MacBook um, Pro computer here. And let's get it over there. And uh, just going to get a little power in there so we don't run, uh, run down the battery or anything. And um, now, uh, what we've got to do is we've got to set up a, um, a microphone that's going to be an input for that. And what we're going to use is a, is a good quality USB microphone. And this is the Blue Yeti. Now let's just clarify a little bit uh, some of the details here dealing with, with the Yeti microphone. So inside here there are actually three sensors and the Yeti allows you to put them in a number of configurations by this dial here. We want it to be all the way to the left or turned counterclockwise and that'll be pointing towards a pattern which is two interlocked circles and that means a stereo pattern. This will get a nice rich sound from all those sensors. Uh, the gain is basically how loud the signal is made coming out of the microphone to the computer. And uh, it seems like having it at about this point, which is where the little indicator is about 8 o'clock on a clock face, uh, all the way down would be here. And sometimes that uh, can work, actually. It's not really off in that position. But I'm going to put it back at 8 o'clock there. Um, on the front, this is connected to the computer. And when I see this constant red light, that is telling me that the signal is going to the computer and when I tell the computer to record it will get signal. This is a mute button so if I press this and I see it start blinking like that it's actually not sending any signal to the computer. Uh, obviously this can be very sad if you have just played a beautiful track and realized that it was blinking the whole time and the computer didn't record anything. So let's make sure that we have this nice constant red light. Now, as far as the connection to the computer, um, if you look here, this is uh, the small mini USB. That's what connects to the bottom. This comes with it, this cord. I'm going to just plug that in. I'm going to make it uh, so that it's in a good position. And as far as when we say good position, I'm putting it on this uh, stand that brings it up to about eye level. I want the microphone, remember the microphone is going to receive signal like this you might think that it would be receiving signal like this. A lot of microphones are that way, but this one is not. It's receiving it at a 90 degree angle, and I want it to be about three and a half feet away from where my playing is happening with my instrument facing towards it. Um, that way it's not too rough or too close, and you get further away and it starts to be fuzzy. Um, as far as connecting it to the computer, the cord that comes with it, um, is a USB-A, and uh, in my case, my laptop or a more recent iPad would need a uh, USB-C. And so I'm going to use this adapter, and that's going to adapt it to USB-C. And that is how I put it in. And now the computer is receiving signal. The light is red. I'm about three and a half feet away. I'm ready to go. Uh, with our computer here, I'm going to immediately go to the sound preferences by opening system preferences from the Apple and then going to where there's a little speaker for sound. Now actually because I plugged it in it's automatically switched over to the Yeti microphone which is just great and uh, let's see how it responds when I... Okay well it's responding pretty well. I have a feeling we did set the level about right but that little dial I showed you could change it if that didn't, didn't look um, correct. 
Now for the output, I'm going to use, right now it says MacBook Pro speakers. That is not what we're going to use because actually that would cause feedback between these. And the crucial part of this whole operation is the way uh, you use headphones. So I'm going to plug in the headphones and uh, right away it's recognizing it. And um, I'm going to, uh, yeah, it's uh, already selected at external headphones. That's great. We've still got our input. Our output's what we want it to be. We can close this. And let me just talk for a minute about how you're going to use these headphones. Um, if you want to listen to the final product, you're going to just do the normal thing. Left over here, right over here. And you're just going to listen with both ears. But for the stacking up of parts, what you need to be doing is something a little different. You are going to just take the right side. Um, I suppose if you wanted to do it another way, but I find for, for at least violin and I, I think for cello too, it's most comfortable to be using your left ear um, uh, for the non-headphone listening. So I'm going to put the right side here. And then I'm going to put the, the left side behind my ear. And then I'm going to just tip it a little bit forward so it doesn't, so it's kind of solid and it won't fall off so easily. Now the crucial part of how we're going to do this is with um, the program GarageBand. I'm going to open GarageBand. And it's going to open a former file. And I'll close that right away. That's a test that we did. And now we're going to create a new project. And it's an empty project. I'm going to choose it. And there we are. And it's immediately asking me, how are you going to get the input for this track? So you see it's, it's already got the microphone selected. We're not doing a guitar or a drummer or anything. We're going to go to the microphone. And uh, now it's already selected the one I want, but I'm going to just show you. We could just have a mono input from the left side of the Yeti or a mono input from the right side of the Yeti. But it'll sound most rich if we let that Yeti, which has the stereo or right and left, I'm going to let it use both of them. That's why it has the linked ring and that's why it's going to be a stereo track. We see the Yeti. That's exactly what we want. Now this is the really crucial part. I want to hear my instrument as I play and record because that's going to allow you to um, hear a little bit of the sound of what you're playing through the earphone. Uh, at the first track that won't matter so much, but as you have more tracks, uh, it, I find it's very crucial to be mixing your sound uh, by hearing a little bit of your new sound mixing with the old sound in the headphone itself. And that seems to be a very productive way to do it, or, or it seems to work. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to create two tracks for each uh, person that's playing. Now, because I can play violin and viola, I chose a piece that's just violin and viola. It's the Dvorak Terzetto. And so there are two violin parts and one uh, viola part. And just for fun, I'm going to change what my vest looks like when I change person. Um, but um, that means that we've got three players and two tracks each. So we're going to create six tracks. Now, by the way, the reason we're creating two tracks is that I'm going to play a phrase and I can stop it at an exact point. And uh, then I do the other parts that layer with it. You'll see that um, unfold. And, um, but then let's say I play continuously. Uh, it might be very awkward to, to handle that moment. But by using the second track, I can just start it a little bit before the other ends. I hear the end of the other phrase and I make a seamless connection with the next thing I need to play. And that also lets me keep track of it in the way the whole thing looks and I kind of know where the phrases are. So let's get started. I got to do this six times. So I'm going to create one and now I will do another one. And everything looks right. Stereo, I want to hear the play as I play and record. It's the Yeti. That's number two. And now I'm going to do it four more times. Now, just to not be confusing for the next person that uses this, in this case it'll be me, but in normal cases it'll be another person after you sent them the file, I'm going to name these. And by do, the way I do that is I double click where it says audio one, and I'm going to say violin one, 
A. And uh, then I'm going to go and do that for all the tracks. So this is going to be violin 1B. This one's going to be violin 2A. I'll go back and correct that. I didn't mean to say violins. Um, 2B. Let's go back to correct it. I just do the same thing. I'll just delete that little S. It was a mistake. And now, finally, viola A and viola B. Now, um, when I have a track selected like that viola B, uh, there's actually a dialog open down here, which is telling me it, I could tell it to do automatic level control, but I don't want to do that because for the music to really come alive, we want to hear those nuances in the parts. Um, now, it's talking about feedback protection. Um, I am actually going to uncheck that because we're in a pretty safe environment with feedback and we want to really hear uh, as, as, as natural um, an inflection of the sound as we can. Um, now, I'm just going to take the instrument and uh, we're seeing those little green lines, and that means that it's picking up from the microphone. But I'm just going to... And it looks good. You see, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's going to, you know, about two-thirds, maybe three-quarters of that little bar uh, that it's filling. And we wouldn't want it to go higher, and we certainly wouldn't want to be seeing yellow or red in a normal environment there. Uh, because that would mean it would be peaking and it would start distorting. So we have a pretty good level now. So if you were finding a strange level, what you would want to be doing is changing this recording level down here. Now I think it's pretty good, so I'm going to leave it where it ended up. And that's about it's just a little past halfway along that bar. Um, okay, I think we're in pretty good shape here. Now when you, uh, the other thing we need to do is that um, uh, GarageBand is designed for people when they want to coordinate with a click track or uh, so with a metronome. So I'm going to have to actually turn off that metronome. And the one, two, three, four is actually gives you a preparatory set of beats so you could start on time. Um, not that that's a terrible thing, but we, we don't need that in this case. Now you notice that the, uh, the, the display here is based on a bar number and a beat number and a tempo. Well that's not really how we're doing it. So I'm going to use this little arrow here and I'm going to change it to time. Uh, and now it's just recording time in the piece. Now I may as well have the whole window here so I'm going to get rid of that dialog and I'm going to get rid of this dialog. And now we have a nice big area to work with. Um, now with your colleagues, what you're going to need to do, you, you can either have a conference that goes on and on as you work through this, or what I really suggest is that you have conferences that kind of, you have a pretty long conference at the beginning, so you plan it out. And then as you carry it out, it actually can spread out over a lot of time. Um, and while you're not recording, uh, frankly, you can practice or you can do something else. Um, uh, but I would actually plan to, to give the other person plenty of time to do their tracks. That, that way they can actually do them many times if they want to and try to make them better and better. Uh, you do need to agree on an A. So uh, right now I'm going to tune the instruments to 441. tuned up. And now the, that longer conference you're going to have is about uh, the music. Now, let me just clarify that, that one of the crucial parts about this, and one of the most interesting parts about this way of putting together a score, is that you're going to be talking with your colleagues and uh, kind of guessing what is the best order to record in. Um, so in my case, on the score, uh, the, I, and I would say you really need to use a score, otherwise you're going to get very confused. So uh, on the score, I will make a little notation at the beginning of each phrase where we're going to cut to a new section. 
um, and I'm just putting a number uh, in the first phrase. The first violin needs to go first. And then conceptually, it seems to work best to, if that's the top line, then we, we actually get the bottom line right after that, because that sort of establishes the intonation. So in this case, the first violin, and then go right to the viola part, the lowest part, and then the third part to be recorded will be the second violin. Um, it happens that in the second phrase, uh, it's uh, not that order. It, the second violin is actually carrying the melody, so it's better to record the second violin first, then the viola, then the first violin. Third phrase goes back to first violin, then viola, then second violin. Um, this is something you basically have to talk through and make a plan, and you may find as you're doing it that the plan you made doesn't quite work or you need to make slight adjustments to it. Um, but uh, what's nice is actually in the process you're really evaluating a lot of things about the score even in just making these original decisions. So, let's get started with violin one. I think everything is here. We've got levels that are working. We're monitoring our sound. That's that little uh, thing that looks like a dot with uh, making sound, with speaker waves coming out of it. And um, so, yeah, I think we're in good shape to get started.